Let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. Good Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, in this month of November, I wish to give a small talk on devotion to the holy souls, the holy and poor souls in purgatory below, because this is the month of the holy and poor souls, the month of November. For two years, I had the great privilege of acting as a chaplain for a group of cloistered nuns. I remember one particular nun, namely Sister Immaculata who suffered greatly with cancer of the stomach and died in her mid-40s. During her last few weeks on earth, Sister Maculata could hardly eat. This good nun also admitted that she used to complain about the smallest pebble in her shoe, but with her cancer, she felt that she had hundreds of sharp, small pebbles in her stomach. I remember awaking very early on a cold March morning, hearing the bells of the convent tolling and announcing the death of Sister Immaculata. She and her religious sisters around her were there at her deathbed, which happened to be facing east, I was told. The sisters had opened up the blinds, revealing to all in the room what is known as the morning star, the planet Venus, that beautiful image of Our Lady, which introduces the rising sun. Although fortified with those final sacraments, for days and days, Sister Immaculata could hardly move and was in excruciating pain. And she quickly rose up in bed upon seeing Mary's morning star, and she reached out her hand towards the window as if to grasp the hand of the risen Christ, to grasp the mantle of Our Lady, perhaps. She then fell back into her bed and began what is known as the death rattle. This virgin, with her lamp alight, was ready to meet the bridegroom. I'm reminded of what Melanchthon, the follower of that arch heretic Martin Luther, once wrote to his dying mother, who was struggling with whether or not to remain within the Catholic Church or to learn to join the Lutheran sect before she passed away. Melanchthon stated, Dear Mother, it is difficult to live as a Roman Catholic, but it is better to die as one. So true. The funeral mass was offered for the repose of the soul of Sister Maculata, with the choir chanting that beautiful introit or entrance antiphon, Requiem eternum done eis domine, it looks perpetual eis, eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. Eventually, the body was buried in a special vault in a crypt church beneath the main chapel, awaiting the future resurrection of the body. She was not cremated. No religious is. <laughs> Rather, she was buried in imitation of our Lord, like a seed in the ground that will arise incorruptible. In this modern world of ours, so filled with the horrors connected with the culture of death and grave crimes against the human body, such as embryonic experimentation, abortion, the barren sodomitical agenda, direct euthanasia, and assisted suicide, is it any wonder then that the bodies of the dead would also be treated in such a utilitarian manner as burning them when the bodies of the living are treated with such disdain. And of course, all of us have read stories in the past few decades of cemeteries being the object of vandalism, with monuments being overturned, beer and liquor bottles, as well as drug paraphernalia strewn on the ground, bonfires, and even consecrated graves being unearthed. And if there is a major, major building project and a cemetery is in the way, 
our modern, pragmatic, utilitarian society will push to move the bodies and disturb the rest of the dead. Such irreverence for the bodies of the dead was rarely seen in ages past. You know, at every Holy Mass, everyone, every single representation of the sacrifice of the cross offered at the altar, we pray for the dead. As the Roman canon puts it, quote, remember those who have died and have gone before us, marked with the sign of faith, especially those for whom we now pray. The fact that we pray for the dead every day, every hour, every minute in the church demonstrates our belief in the doctrine of purgatory. You don't pray for the saints in heaven. Rather, we pray to them. And as for the souls in hell, our prayers for them would be absolutely useless, for their end is fixed and cannot be reversed. Can't lose heaven once you die. You can't gain heaven if you're in hell, once you die, it's over. Lex orandi, lex credendi, very well-known phrase. The law of praying is the law of believing. Our prayer shows our belief. Yet despite all the prayers for the dead, the existence of purgatory has often been denied, completely forgotten, or simply ignored. And this is very understandable. Considering the modern world largely denies the notion of sin, so why would the notion of a place where the temporal punishments due to sin are burned away, how could that be acceptable to modern man who's lost the sense of sin, therefore has lost the sense of penance? My good grandmother on my mother's side suffered for years due to congestive heart failure causing her to go to the hospital a dozen times in just one month. When I visited her and brought her the sacraments, I mentioned the potential atoning power of her sufferings when united to Christ, and she could possibly do her purgatory here on earth. She then looked at me and asked, Purgatory? Do we still believe in that? I remember, too, speaking with a Polish priest who was working here in the States a few years back. This good priest of God loved America, but he insisted that when he died, his body would be flown back home and buried in Poland. And I remarked this was a wonderful idea since he wished to be buried near his relatives and friends. But he looked at me with all seriousness and said, that's not the reason. No, I want to be buried in my homeland because there they will pray for my soul, whereas here they largely will not. Again, the principle, lex orandi, lex credendi, applies. The liturgical landscape in the Latin rite has been devastated over the last 40 years or so, 50 years, with black vestments being replaced with white ones, with masses of the resurrection, in the presence of a corpse instead of requiem and Gregorian masses, and with eulogies and sermons that canonize instead of appealing for prayers to bring comfort to the deceased. That's why a funeral mass is offered. It's for the deceased first and foremost to comfort him. Using sacred scriptures and sacred tradition, the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church, has solemnly defined two things regarding this issue. First, purgatory exists, dogma. The Catechism states, quote, all who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. And then it ends by saying the church gives the name of purgatory to this final purification of the elect, unquote. Another way, those who depart this life, neither good enough for heaven nor bad enough for hell, there is a place where any evil is completely purged and the good 
will be perfectly developed. Hence, we have three provinces of the kingdom of God, the Catholic Church. The church triumphant in heaven, the church militant on earth, and yes, the church suffering below in purgatory, where it is near hell. And as many of you know, the fires of hell are the fires of purgatory. The second defined dogmatic teaching regarding purgatory is that those residents present in that temporary holding cell can and ought to be prayed for by the living. The living here on earth, the church militant, the saints above. A good image to keep in mind when thinking of a soul in purgatory is a beggar holding a tin cup and asking for the alms of your prayers. Since any growth in grace and meriting happens only while in the body, the souls of the church suffering cannot help themselves, but they depend upon us to assist in paying down their debts. These dear souls were good and faithful soldiers who fought the good fight, but were wounded in the battle with the remains of forgiven sins and unrepented venial sins upon them. They cry out in their need as long as they long with an unrelenting thirst for the living water that is above. We can relieve their painful suffering with our prayers. We can offer holy masses for the deceased so that the drops of the most precious blood may strengthen them. And we can even employ that old Irish custom of taking holy water upon entering the church, perhaps sprinkling some upon the floor so that some relief might be offered to those souls in the midst of purgatorial fires below. It just went off to visit the cemetery a few times during this special octave, All Saints to the octave of All Saints, November 1st, November 8th, gaining, hopefully, plenty of indulgences for the souls in purgatory. And I made sure that I brought holy water with me and I, and I sprinkled many of the graves that I passed by, giving them a little relief. But the doctrine, the dogma of purgatory, is not just a truth of divine revelation, it's also most reasonable. You see, our faith tells us that only the purest of the pure can go to heaven. Blessed are the pure or clean of heart, for they shall see God. The book of Revelation clearly teaches that nothing unclean, nothing defiled can enter into heaven. In short, only unblemished souls, only angels and saints can breathe that clean air, that altitude sort of air in the celestial paradise above. If one rejects purgatory, then, that, that means that anyone with even the slightest stain, the smallest attachment to created things, would end up in hell when they died. Dying in a state of venial sin or some sort of deathbed conversion after a life of serious sin would not be good enough for salvation if purgatory were somehow eliminated. Certainly, Purgatory is about satisfaction. It's about atonement. It's about paying debts, plain and simple. But purgatory is not about a vengeful or tyrannical God who delights in somehow scourging his creatures. He is not some sort of unjust warden in a prison camp, but rather a father who truly seeks to transform his dear children into the full stature of Christ. He wants us to be perfect, to be another Christ. And like a father who might send a child to his room as a punishment so that he can reflect upon his infraction, the good Lord does not enjoy punishing the soul, but is rather saddened, if you will, as he awaits the child's return. The fires of purgatory may be punishing, but they are purifying. You punish iron by thrusting it into a furnace and hammering it into shape. But in so doing, you make a beautiful object, a wondrous sword. As a final note, again, as we remember 
this month for all souls, the poor and holy souls in purgatory, there was a commercial that ran on TV in past years for a product called Fram oil filters. The spokesman was a garage mechanic who warned car owners who rarely changed their oil and filter that an individual could pay him now or pay him later. That is, pay for an expensive, or rather pay for an inexpensive filter now, or pay a huge repair bill later. So it goes to purgatory. One could seek to do one's purgatory on earth with prayers, acts of self-denial, penance, and mercy now while we live when it's powerful and effective, or you can do your purgatory after death. It is much more reasonable and advantageous to be fully formed in the church militant versus enduring the pains of purgatory, which according to St. Augustine, are a fire that will be more severe than any pain that can be felt, seen, or imagined in this world. Therefore, aim high. Don't settle for purgatory. At least that should not be your goal. If I can just make it to purgatory, how many people have say it said that? First of all, that's not seeking to give great glory to God, number one, but heaven's a pretty far distance off. And if you aim too low, you might miss the target altogether. Our target to shoot for is heaven and sainthood, giving glory to God. We should be walking towards the pearly gates as opposed to the emergency room entrance of purgatory. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.